and welcome. It's a new day and a new week here at the Nonprofit Show. And Julia and I are thrilled to have with us today Ellen Owens Carsey joining us from the Carsey Group. You might want to take a deep breath because you really want to wait before you automate, which is fascinating because I always think, let's just do it. Let's let's get on this automation train. Let's make that happen. But instead, we're going to take a deep breath. We're going to get centered and really figure it out what makes the most sense in regards to our automation. So Ellen's been on before, and we'll share a little bit more about herself in just a moment. But before we pass the mic, we <laughs> want to remind all of our viewers and listeners around the globe who we are. So Julia Patrick, hello to you. Julia mm -hmm. serves as the CEO of the American um, Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom, nonprofit nerd and CEO of The Raven Group. We are so honored to have the collective support from these amazing presenting sponsors. Shout out of gratitude to our friends over at Bloomering, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the companies that help us to stay moving forward to our 1000th episode coming up soon. Actually, next month, we are getting closer and closer as the, the day goes on. But thrilled to have the support from our partners that have helped us pr to produce these episodes, which you can find them here. So go ahead and pull out that phone that you're probably also on. You can scan that QR code. You can still find us on the streaming broadcast as well as the podcast channels. So wherever you like to binge watch, binge listen, you can cue us up there. All right, Ellen, thrilled to start a Monier with you because you know, you've heard me before, but Friday gets all the fun. <laughs> so Monier, let's make this day fun as well. But Ellen owens Carse has joined us. She's owner and transformational advisor at Carse Group. Welcome back. Yes, great to be back. Great to be back. And yes, happy Monday. <laughs> You know, Ellen, I I held up in the green room chatter um, the current issue of the Chronicle of Philanthropy. It's all about AI and, and navigating through the technology um, challenges and opportunities that we have. And so we really thought this was a great time to get you on to kind of give us some perspective, because I think, as Jarrett mentioned, you know, we get all like excited and and actually pressured to move forward sometimes without really even taking that deep breath. And so let's start off and, and have you really give us a framework here because you're saying we need to assess what our automation potential is. And I can't even imagine where we start with this. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, take your deep breath, inhale, exhale. <laughs> Because so much is coming at us right now with AI, robotic process automation, this tool, that tool, we got to do it today. And, and the reality is that things are moving so quickly that it's important for everybody just take a pause for a second and say, what are we really trying to do here? What are our objectives? What are our goals with quote unquote automation um, and embedding this into our day to day? So uh, it, it's really important to first say, if we're going to do this, what is our potential to be successful? What are we trying to achieve? What are our goals and objectives by automating a process? Mm -hmm. And then also, am I automating something um, that is a bad process, which we're going to talk about? Um, do I really know if this is going to have the, the impact that I'm going to want it to have? Do we have big changes on the horizon that we need to consider before we dive into this? Do we uh, anticipate any structural organizational changes? And then capacity. Do we have the capacity to take on this level of a project? And you may not know that until you get into it a little bit more, but understanding if your group has the capacity to take on such a big project, because they can be big, um, is important to understand question um perhaps a curveball and i know you're you're up for all these sports analogies um i'm curious does the software platform tend to be the one that nudges us for automation i get a lot of emails that'll say we now automate with x y and z platform 
Or are you finding it's the human, us, that says, there's got to be a simpler way? Where are you finding that like thought to, to even initiate automation? I love that question, Jared. That's a cool, that's a cool question. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. I, unfortunately, I do think it's the shiny object uh, that attracts us. And uh, most often it, it's, hey, I saw that this other group or I know this other group or other organization that is using this tool or that tool. And right. my answer to that typically is, are your processes exactly the same as theirs? Are you trying to achieve the exact same thing? Because it may or may not be a perfect fit. It may not uh, help you get to where you want to be. So I think yeah. it's first, you know, the the idea of the potential and ideating, giving your teams the opportunity to innovate and ideate about the what can be, uh, you know, would be nice if we could drive that direction. But unfortunately, it's usually the uh, influence. Yeah. Before we go on, what amount of time should we dedicate to this process? Like how long should we all, you know, sit down and really look at this. Is this something that we can, you know, do in a week or two weeks, or is this going to be something that we really are going to have to, to give more time, a lot more time for? Really should give way more time. Uh, you know, a lot of implementations, usually they'll say anywhere from six to eight months. I can tell you from experience that it's usually longer than that. It depends on a lot of different factors. Um, in terms of how big you're trying to go with some sort of automation or, um, again, capacity needs and timeline. So we're going to talk timeline, I know, in a little bit. But um, yeah, these are not just quick things uh, that you can implement and, and hope to be successful. There's probably little tools here and there that are a shorter time to go live. But um, overall, these are, should be part of a bigger strategy and saying, yeah. what are we trying to do? Right. But I think what my question, and I didn't probably frame it correctly, is the assessment part. Like how oh. long should, because I know implementation can take a long time, but just the assessment. I mean, because a lot of times when we when we make assessments, um, it, it's a stumbling block, right? And I'm just curious, like how, how we should look at that time frame. Uh, it, I'm going to go back to capacity because I think it's a very useful tool to say what uh, uh, automation aside, any kind of software aside, let's just look at our organization today. And, and some people might call it maturity. Like how mature is our organization? Do we have governance structures in place? Do we have a good financial model? Do we have a good staffing model? Do we have systems, processes, policies, and procedures? Are our facilities up to date? Let's get those basics and make sure where we're at and understand where we're at today from a capacity and then say, what are the opportunities? What are those opportunities and build up from there? So the assessment process, I would say, you know, you're, you're going to get more out of it the more time you invest into that assessment process. Good and advice. who should be part of that conversation? Uh, that's a great question. Some <laughs> I've, I've had this experience where, it's like, oh, we're going to have these select people be a part of the process. And I think it's a miss because the broader that you go initially in the assessment phase, and then you can narrow it down because you want to tie up everybody's time and meetings and conversations. But getting a perspective, a broad range, not only internally, but perhaps externally and voice of the customer. We were talking about that in the green room, but getting the voice of the customer, your clients, your donors. Maybe getting some perspectives from them will be super helpful in terms of understanding what you, uh, what gaps need to be addressed. Wow. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like quite, quite the overhaul we're looking to do. Mm -hmm. Let's jump into the definition. Like how do we define as well as document these efficient, and I feel like that's the key word, efficient wow. processes, because clearly we don't want to make more garbly goop out of, out of a process. Exactly. You can automate bad process. Yeah. So <laughs> you yeah. implement that automation tool and it's a bad process, you're going to get bad automation. So uh, this is, yeah, this is my favorite part because my approach is to work with organizations by literally getting a big room and going old school with sticky notes and flip charts and markers and having people move around and actually walk through the process. 
And mm -hmm. I and the the idea is that number one, I think it's extremely beneficial to have someone facilitate these conversations who is not aware of the process. Mm -hmm. um, when I go in and work with an organization, I am not afraid to ask questions. If it's not clear to me, I will ask. It's this is not clear to me. You need to be clear and very specific in your process. The other thing I find is when you have teams or cross-functional teams working through a process and we're sticking sticky notes and say, okay, where does it start? What's the next step? Sometimes what you'll find is that three people have differing opinions of what really is the next step. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to uncover because that may help you discover where some of those pain points or bottlenecks are occurring. And so as you map out the process with all of these sticky notes to take a step back and go, wow, there's a lot of steps in our process. Where do we have overlaps, redundancy? Where do we have parallel work lines happening and starting to have conversations? And that happened recently with a client where as I had a cross-functional team, I realized that the three uh, groups within that team were doing the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Wow. And I was like, you, their potential is to collapse these into a centralized function so that you don't have three teams doing exactly the same thing. Now, sure, there's always challenges. There's always things you have to adjust. Uh, but to ask the question and to point it out can be very helpful from a different perspective. What was their response to that? Were were yeah. they just dumbfounded? I mean, how yeah. how did they take that aha moment, if you will? Yeah, they they at first were like, oh, we never thought about it that way because they're so busy doing what they need to do and uh, hearing what some of their pain points were. And I was like, well, I can see why you have that pain point now because you're so tied up, each of you. Uh, you're not getting your economy of scale by centralizing this function uh, in a central group. And so uh, their response was, the immediate response to change as it often is, is like, Oh, wait, but that means trickle down effect change. And I was like, but the trade off, if you do this, it can be just monumental and give you back time. Yes. So it, it was, it was kind of very eye opening for them to see it on paper. Well, I have to say, I found, found it eye opening because I got to be a part of this process with you, Ellen, uh, working with a client, a mutual client of ours to see literally old school pen to paper, post-it notes, index cards on the wall, multiple departments involved. Um, so many aha moments came from that, as well as a lot of, you know, as one of our guests previously called it the Scooby-Doo, where like your yeah. head just cocks and you're like, what? <laughs> it's just so eye-opening, eye which I think like one of the big ahas from that uh, that I got to be a part of was really to understand where the data was coming from. And because we pulled in multiple people, we were able to bring in different data points. So help us to understand in regards to automation, why it's important to understand where the data is truly coming from. Uh, so with any of these platforms, automation, AI, it's all about the data. I mean, it's, it relies on data to come into the system to be processed and to be put out into another form. And so one thing that I have also found to be true is that um, for a variety of different reasons, organizations are tending to store data into multiple places, number one. So it's duplication of data sources. And there's no single source of truth. And it's important to get to a single source of truth where the data is the correct data. And then these systems pull from those that, that um, uh, source of data. And so when we do process mapping, oftentimes I'll ask about, well, where do these data points come from? Where, what system currently feeds into this process or connects to this process? And so, that can also give an indication and start in that assessment process, understanding what do we really, what do we need in terms of a tool or a platform and what kind of data are we going to store there? The other thing is junk in, junk out, right? So right. if your data is bad, uh, you either the system will not automate it properly or you'll have gaps uh, perhaps. And one of the examples that I would give are something as simple as the format for date of birth. Some 
people and some countries and cultures uh, put in dates of birth with month, then day, then year versus day, then month, then year. Um, and so different formats, uh, different ways. And so if you don't understand or it's not very specific or it's not clean, the data is not clean, putting that back into an automation process could um, break the process or uh, at least not provide you the results you were looking for. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, it just upends things so um, in such a tremendous way. You know, Jared mentioned something in the green room, and and um, I think this is a, a really interesting segue to how do you know where you're going and what you're going to need? You know, a lot of times we say, oh, we want growth, we want growth, we want growth, but we don't really know what that's going to do. We just think of, of the revenue. And that's great. And that's going to allow us to do more programming or get, you know, better salaries or expand our campus, whatever. But we don't always understand or look at what those costs of that growth are going to be internally. How do we look at this? Yeah. So cost is a real interesting piece because uh, as you go through the assessment process, you understand what you're trying to do. You get clear goals and objectives. The next stage is to understand what are what are our requirements? What do we really need to have out of automation in a system? What do we need it to be able to do? What do we need it to be able to, what other systems do we need it to be able to integrate with um, so that the accounting system is talking to this system or a membership or a donor system, they're all connecting, right? So you get to that point and you get ready to say, these are our, our requirements, our business requirements. These are the user scenarios that we're trying to achieve. And then you start vetting out potential platforms. And that's where you get these wonderful presentations about we can do it. And I, I'm I'm being really <laughs> silly because no, that is that's what they're supposed to do, right? But the reality is when it comes down to cost to understand what is the payment structure? What is the cost structure? Is it subscription or is it based on data? Is it based on users? So if it's based on how much data or how many records, understand how many records do you anticipate? If it's based on users, how many users actually will be using the system? Um, is there additional storage cost for, for the data that's being stored? Um, asking what is your year one cost and then your three year total cost of ownership. Not just how much does it cost for the licenses, but what is the total cost of ownership? What is the total implementation cost? Mm -hmm. Implementation costs are usually what gets people because it's, it's the software may be very attainable from a licensing perspective, but you oftentimes need someone, a part, third party integrator or systems um, implementation partner to come in and do that work. And that can cost anywhere from 25,000 upwards to $100,000 to do for a system. Oh. And I don't think yeah. that is often the organizations I've worked with, Ellen, budgeted in a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this needs to be a future goal, right? So like, if we're looking at doing this, we need like, when are we adding that into our budget? Because I don't think this is something we can say, we have this pain point, we want to automate, we want to take the proper channels and steps to do so, but we don't have 30 grand right now. Right? So like, is this a, a conversation that needs to happen for the next year or two years even? Yeah, uh, putting that, if you know, uh, and I'm working with a client right now who, you know, fortunately for them, they had been through this before. So sure. they knew, they kind of had line of sight. So they had planned well in advance, knowing okay. we need to allocate this money in our budget, knowing that we're going to need to replace this system moving forward in the future. And so, um, yes, plan ahead for those types that when you have line of sight of something that you want to do starting to put that into the budget and understanding those implementation costs are often one-time costs. So mm -hmm. how you structure that versus, you know, operational versus capital versus whatever, um, however you structure that in your budget. And then understanding what is the total cost of ownership of this platform moving forward. It's not just licensing usually. There's sometimes maintenance fees. There's sometimes support costs. 
that you may need, uh, you know, finding out is training involved with my implementation? Do we need to have people trained going forward? Um, do, do my other systems require updates? So there's so many fine points and I continue to learn every single time I pick up pieces every single time, like, oh man, I should have asked that question. So it, because things change, things yeah, sure. are constantly changing. So um, that's a big one, the total cost of ownership. And then I wanted to say too, the cost, not financial, but understanding to the, the people impacted by automation, understanding how that impacts them from a change management perspective. Mm -hmm. When some people hear automation, they're like, oh, they're automating me out of a job. Right. And it's workforce reduction. And so under helping people understand and get their minds wrapped around what you're trying to achieve with automation to elevate other people's jobs, to reduce re inefficiencies, whatever it is, but make sure you're considering the people side of this yeah. process. It reminds me of our, our friend, Shauna Olds with Boodle. And he said, AI is coming for your job, but for the pieces of your job that you shouldn't be doing anyway. <laughs> yeah. So I, I thought of that, Jarrett, exactly. I was thinking of yeah. that because he was like, you're going to be able to do things that are a lot more interesting mm -hmm. as opposed to just the, the uh, mundane and kind of that. Yeah. That piece that's not that's not any fun. Well, for me as a fundraiser, and we know that we have lots of fundraisers that are part of this audience. If I can spend more one-on-one -on -one time with donors and less in the data entry, the follow-up, like how much of that could be automated with some personalization, the more face time we have, I think that will show a greater ROI. Uh, in the long run. So there's a, there's a lot to think about. Um, Ellen, before we sign off, I just have to ask what if automation goes awry, right? Like what if there's a hiccup and we're like, none of this is working and we just spent all this time. What should we plan as a plan B? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually in the, in the process of the plan, uh, of implementation, you should always have what we call a rollback plan. Mm -hmm. What happens if something doesn't work? Now, it, as part of a deployment of any kind of process or automation, you usually do some kind of testing to make sure whatever we just implemented is working and somebody does data validation to make sure the data transferred over correctly and looks correct. Because the last thing you want to have happen, and you may have experienced this where an automated email goes out and there's a bunch of gobbledygook in the email because the automation didn't happen correctly or you got uh, there it's coming to you but it's like that's not my name so that's the last thing you want to have happen are those that's more public facing things that happen before you check your work so to speak um so yeah it's it you need to have a rollback plan in case it doesn't work correctly but the gate is that testing that happens such great insight. It sounds like you've done this a few thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, it, I love it. I love it. Yeah. It's been, it's been really fun having you here. I've got to ask one more question. And this came in kind of through my, my sense of your process, you know, evaluating, understand what works, you know, looking at where you can improve, understanding the costs, the human costs, the financial costs, you know, time served. How long is this going to last? I mean, it used to be, and I don't know if it still is, that when you bought a new computer, whether it was like a mainframe or a simple laptop, that kind of the, the chatter was, this is only going to really be efficient between 24 and 36 months. Is there something in terms of a time frame that's the same way when we're looking at this? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, it it kind of depends on what the platform is you're talking about mm -hmm. uh, in terms of that. But I, I think everything has that turnover cycle. And the good thing is that a lot of the platforms have built in those types of upgrades. So you it can, they can bring you along. Okay. So <laughs> make okay. sure you like who you're working with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because if you like that, the best thing to do is to stick with it and not make those changes and let them upgrade. And that's actually a really good question to ask in your um, interviews of potential platforms is to say, 
do you plan, what's on your roadmap? What's on your advancement roadmap? Yeah. So they can bring you along. And, um, you know, who's to say it may have a, a cost impact to the, to the end user, but at the same time, it's going to be less costly to have to flip over to a whole different system. So I, I think that's the good thing as we become cloud-based versus things that are on-premise, it's easier to do those types of updates and to be agile and making those things happen on the back end. Good. Well, thank you. Because it's it's uh, one of those things is we're, is we're looking at all of this in a new and different way. Um, we got to be asking these questions and and I think a lot of times we start some we start on a journey and then all of a sudden these questions start popping up and um, it can be a little intimidating. Ellen Owens Carr say owner transformational advisor. That's the best title ever. Transformation transform transformational advisor. I want to have one of those in my life. Carse Group. Um, carsegroup.com. Check them out. Give you a lot of information about different things that are going on. You have a really robust um, level of knowledge and, and input for, for all different types of uh, nonprofits that are, can be looking at this. And so we really appreciate you coming on today and, and sharing your knowledge um, because this is where we're at. I mean, I, I held up the cover of, you know, the Chronicle of Philanthropy, but really, you know, the issue of AI I mean, if you just open your email every day, don't you find Jarrett? It's just like that. This is what everybody's That's talking about. It is. Yeah. yeah, it is totally inundated. I mean, even to the fact where my 13 year old, you know, is working on his homework and he's like, mom, do you have chat GPT? And I'm like, duh, of course I have chat GPT, <laughs> you know? And he's like, can I use it? And I was like, for your homework? No. <laughs> so yeah, it's I mean, prevalent. It, it's everywhere. It is. it is. And it's where we need to be thinking about and, and what we need to be looking at. So um, Ellen, this has been a great conversation. I really, really appreciate it. Again, everybody, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jared R. Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. And again, we have amazing partners who really help us with these conversations. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Um, wow, Jared. Okay, this was a great way to start a Monday, I feel. A what? This, I, what? I know. A Monday. I'm sorry. A Monday. A Monday. Yeah. And I think you feel like it's like you want to have this conversation yeah. on a Monday. Well, I feel like we need to have it more often because as, you know, we talk about this as technology advances and it's happening faster than I can even, any of us can even keep, you know, a hold of, it's constantly changing. And uh, this is not my wheelhouse automation, but I know that there are some amazing, talented people like you, Ellen. So thank you for bringing this topic to the forefront and giving us permission to take a breath to breathe and to pause before we actually like implement automation. I think that was a huge takeaway because we're so ready to run the races, hit the finish line, but really we need to think through this strategically. Absolutely. Thank you both. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Hey everybody, as we end every episode of the nonprofit show, we leave you with this message and it goes like this to stay well, so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.